Well, oh, hi everybody. Thank you for coming out to uh, the second History Speaker Series event of the semester. Um, with us today is Valerie Deacon, who is the Elihu Rose Assistant Professor at New York University. Her work on right-wing French resistors in the Second World War has just been published or is forthcoming in the Journal of Contemporary History, and she has widely presented um, several invited talks and many, many conferences. All of this, however, pales, and, and Valerie was insistent that I mention this, yes. in comparison to the award of Best Overall <laughs> Baker um, at the NYU History Department, which has recently been featured in their departmental newsletter. Absolutely. I'm very proud of myself for that feat. <laughs> so although she did not bake these, she did not bake But I think without further ado, I'll turn it over to Valerie. Great. Thank you, so thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Ian, for inviting me. This is great. I've been looking forward to this for weeks now. So I'll just jump right in. Uh, in late 1937, the French Minister of the Interior, who was Marx Dormoy at the time, announced that the police had uncovered, quote, a genuine plot against Republican institutions. Alongside a spate of arrests, the police also focused on searching the many Parisian properties belonging to the conspirators. Over the course of one year, the police found more than 7,000 grenades, around 30 machine guns, 230 German and Italian automatic weapons, 150 handguns, more than 150 hunting rifles, 300,000 cartridges, and more than 150 kilos of explosives in all of these homes and businesses. These discoveries sent shockwaves all throughout France and sent journalists scrambling to figure out what kind of group could have amassed such a stockpile of weapons. But they did not come altogether as a surprise. Strange crimes had been occurring all through 1936 and 1937 that remained unsolved, as the police and public had few guesses about who was responsible for them. Nobody had claimed responsibilities for these crimes, and the police had few <coughs> leads to follow. Thus, the discovery of these many weapons depots might have struck the general public as simply another element in this ongoing criminal drama. Yet these discoveries were different. The police did know who they were looking for. They even had a name to call the secret organization that had collected all these weapons. And that name was the Comité Secret d'Action Révolutionnaire. So more colloquially, you may have heard of this group as the Cagoul, um, which in English just means, of course, the hooded ones. And this was a moniker given to the group by Maurice Pujol of the monarchist journal Action Française to mock what he saw as a very childish political organization. Though Pujol mocked the group, the Cagoul had indeed been responsible for some of the most public and notorious crimes in the previous two years. The group had been and continues to be described as a terrorist organization, given its proclivities for using many of the same techniques as latter-day terrorists. While there is no question that there are significant similarities between the group and other terrorist organizations, that label really doesn't capture the full extent of the Kagul's activities or the intentions behind the group's crimes. So the Kagul engaged in various acts of destabilization, much like terrorists, but they used principles of provocation that were somewhat unique. So rather than taking responsibility for their crimes, members of the group always made it look like somebody else was responsible. So ultimately, the Kagul was hoping to create a fearful population, but was at the same time simultaneously setting itself up um, as the only organization that could save France from the chaos that it itself had created. So ultimately, the Cagoulards are indeed sort of prototypical agents provocateurs, uh, attempting to tear down French society from within. Their crimes had ranged from several very public murders, including a murder on the Paris metro that remains officially unsolved to this day, uh, as the murder took place on what was, for all intents and purposes, an empty subway car, uh, save, of course, for the victim. Uh, and it took place between stops. So at one stop, the victim got on, the subway car was empty. By the time the train pulled into the next stop, she was dead or dying of a very, very deep stab wound, and nobody had seen anybody else come or go from the subway car. So very mysterious indeed. Uh, the Kegel was also responsible for very public bombings in the center of Paris, several cases of arson, and, and their final crime, a call to arms in November of 1937, ostensibly to protect France from, from an impending communist coup. 
In reality, not a single leader of the Kagul believed that there was any threat from the communists. They simply capitalized on societal fears about the strength of communism in France to gather their own forces, ultimately hoping to take over the government that night in November. Much to their dismay, the Cagoulards discovered that night that they did not have the support of the army and thus found their plans rather foiled by this. By this point though, their time had really passed, the police were hot on their trail, and soon most of the leading members of the Cagoule would be either in jail or in exile in Spain. In 1939, however, as war broke out with Germany, the majority of these men were either out on bail already or were set free so that they could enlist, as the need for manpower in 1939 was apparently greater than the sense of justice for all of these crimes that they'd committed. Thus, when France was defeated in the summer of 1940, and the Third Republic was replaced by Marshal Philippe Pétain's Vichy regime, the former members of the Cagoule were faced with the same decisions that basically all French people faced at the time. What stance would they take vis-à-vis -vis the new government? Would they cooperate with the occupying Germans? Would they use the new political situation to their advantage somehow? These were all questions that they were considering. So my research that has sort of culminated in a manuscript focuses on members of the extreme right and especially the members of the extreme right who come from the Cagoul and another secret organization called the Corvignol who end up choosing in 1940 to resist the German occupation. So many earlier studies of the resistance had acknowledged the presence of the right, but rarely did they offer a sustained investigation into the seeming paradox of anti-Republican participation in what was and continues to be seen as a Republican phenomenon. However, it's the seeming paradox, I argue, that makes such a study all the more interesting. How did people who in the pre-war years had actively sought to bring down the Republican form of government choose during the war to, the resi to resist all the while suspecting that it would result in the recreation of the parliamentary system. So ultimately, they're quite aware of the fact that their efforts are probably going to end up in the same kind of government that they'd been struggling against for many years. Or to highlight the paradox, why did these individuals not side with Vichy when it would have seemed to be the logical choice for them? The members of both the Cagoule and the Corvignol tended to be anti-Republican, first and foremost, uh, anti-Semitic, anti-communist also, and wedded to violence as a form of insurrection. So by and large, most of them would have found a pretty happy home in the new Vichy regime. But many of them choose instead to oppose the Germans and Vichy and to engage in illegal and extremely dangerous resistance activities for the duration of the war. So I, in my work, I track their trajectory from the fringes of the extreme right, because they truly are on the, on the most extreme end, to the resistance, and I try to explore both their motivations for taking these paths, but also the way that their presence is dealt with after the war is over, and this is a topic that I'll return to shortly. Obviously, I don't have time today to discuss all the men and women that I study, so I'd actually just like to focus more concretely on one example for the duration of my talk, and that's the example of Maurice Duclos. He is perhaps the most celebrated of all the Cagoulard's resistors, as his position of authority in Charles de Gaulle's intelligence services in London and his successes in setting up various resistance networks in France end up being highly publicized after the war. So if you Google Maurice Duclos, you will almost immediately find his biography on the Order of the Liberation website. And you will notice on that website that there is no mention of his pre-war activities with the Kagul whatsoever. And things like this, this memorialization of, of people like him stripping him of his politicized activity effectively erases the fact that Duclos was an unrepentant right winger who spent many years trying to demolish the Third Republic in France. Furthermore, his move to Argentina immediately after the war and the fact that he only returned to France once between 1945 and his death in 1981 
means that the memory of Duclos as a man of the resistance, rather than an explosive wielding terrorist, which I'll just remind you was in fact what he'd done for most of the 1930s, is secure, right? His reputation has been secured. So let me tell you a little bit about that process. Duclos had been arrested and imprisoned for his Cagoulard crimes along with the rest of his colleagues in the 1930s. He was, however, released and mobilized at the start of the war and rejoined his old regiment of colonial artillery. After hostilities are suspended, I mean, once France asks for an armistice, Duclos immediately leaves for London. And he secures a meeting with Charles de Gaulle once there. And he, he is entirely honest when he introduces himself to de, or to de Gaulle. He says, you know, hello, happy to meet you. I'm Lieutenant Duclos, presumed Cagoulard is how he puts it. But of course, we know that he was in fact a Cagoulard. Tells de Gaulle about the 3.5 months that he'd spent in the very infamous French prison, the Santé, and says that he's come to respond to de Gaulle's uh, now famous appeal. De Gaulle ends up asking Duclos to stay in England, but he also asks Duclos, and this is a direct quote, now about your little friends, the Cagoulards, where are they, hey? De Gaulle's clearly skeptical that anybody coming from the Cagoule would end up supporting his resistance activities. And according to the woman who interviews Duclos after the war, he finds this really injurious. He's quite angry that de Gaulle would, would even ask such a thing. And he responds to de Gaulle, de Gaulle apparently by saying, I am certain that those who I know will fight for France against the Germans. Now, Duclos ultimately is rather mistaken about the loyalty of all of his Cagoulard comrades, but he had indeed met with other high-ranking Cagoulards in the summer of 1940. And in what I see as a really extraordinary moment, one I think which highlights some of the conclusions that I draw in my research, Duclos met with Eugène de Loncle and Gabriel Jantet in August of 1940 at a cafe in Paris. So de Loncle had been the leader of the Cagoule and went around describing himself as mean. He was always trying to highlight his nasty tendencies. Uh, Jean Tay was also a central member of the group, though he was not quite as explicitly violent as de Lancle. And at this meeting, the three men basically sit down to weigh their options for their future actions. So Jean Tay decides that he's gonna go to Vichy in the hopes of securing a position uh, within Pétain's new government, which he successfully does. De Lancle is tempted by the possibilities of collaborating closely with the Germans, so he decided to stay in Paris and create a new ultra-collaborationist group uh, called the Mouvement Social Révolutionnaire. And Duclos made the decision to go to London, hoping that he could carry on the fight against the Germans from there. These three men have this discussion part ways amicably and indeed continue to maintain their relationship with one another all throughout the war, even though their respective choices uh, basically mark them as enemies in the new political climate. In 1949, uh, so after the war, when Duclos is giving his testimony about his wartime activities, he continues to insist on the integrity of his friends. Um, he says that at this summer meeting, he told his fellow Cagoulards, quote, I am with de Gaulle, that's why I wanted to see you. Given the organization of the Cagoule, you can help the clandestine networks, end quote. And Duclos continues to insist that Eugène de Lancle was playing a double game with the Germans, though he does note that de Lancle was never particularly effective and never much help during the war. Uh, just as a side note, we know very clearly that de Lancle was not playing a double game. He, he truly was passionate about um, his collaboration with the Germans. Uh, Duclos also said that, you know, the reason Jean Tay wanted to go to Vichy was because he didn't want to ever have to dirty his hands with the Germans. And he thought that being at the heart of Vichy would prevent uh, such a thing from happening. Now, Duclos works tirelessly in London within the intelligence organization that Charles de Gaulle sets up during the war. But he also makes several extremely hazardous trips back to France to organize uh, resistance networks on the ground, all of which, of course, are dangerous. So anybody who was parachuting into France was at risk for all kinds of dangers. Uh, but one of Duclos' later trips proved to be even more hazardous as he undertook 
what was ultimately a, a blind parachute drop into France on February 14th, 1941. So his mission was to extend his existing network, so that's why he was going. But the pilot made a mistake and dropped him on a particularly unforgiving patch of land. To complicate this drop, Duclos' parachute also doesn't open properly. So one of his colleagues describes the ordeal as follows, and I quote here this very dramatic piece. With pieces of wood, he made splints for his injured legs and attached them with the cord from his parachute. Then he crawled nearly two kilometers until he arrived at a small farm in front of which he fainted." End quote. So Duclos is woken in front of this farm um, by the farmer who owned the property, who had called a doctor to come and tend to Duclos, but had also at the same time denounced him to the local police. So Duclos is arrested by the local police. He concocts a story about how he'd actually gone to England as a member of Vichy's own intelligence services uh, to infiltrate the intelligence services in London and then had been sent back to spy for them. So basically he tries to make it seem that he's playing this great double game. And according to two of his colleagues, Duclos manages to convince the police of this story and was let go shortly thereafter. But it now seems clear, actually, that the reason Duclos was able to secure his release was because he relied on his old Cagoulard relationship. So he actually appeals directly to Gabriel Gentet, one of the men that he'd met in the, in the summer of 1940, who was still working at Vichy, and it was Gentet who actually secured Duclos' release for him. So though he's ultimately freed from captivity, Duclos finds himself unable to leave France, and it's sort of at this point where he learns that the radio operator who had accompanied him on the trip was in fact working for the Germans. So the large network that Duclos had worked so hard to create ends up being decimated by arrests. Duclos himself was not married, so he was a bachelor, but his sister and his niece were both arrested at this point and deported to Germany as Nacht und Nebel, so the a night in fog, right, uh, pretty much arrested in the night. Uh, Duclos only manages to get out of France over a year after this, this, this disastrous drop. And he does so by pretending, interestingly enough, to be a French Canadian. This was a, a common trick for many resistors. Um, and he reaches Spain, where he's then picked up and returned to England. So I don't have a ton of time to talk about the specifics of the kind of work that Duclos did in England, but he is the head of a very important Gaullist intelligence service, he helps concoct and execute detailed sabotage plans in preparation for the Normandy landings. And he ends up rejoining a military unit, ultimately ending the war in Germany behind enemy lines as part of a French and American commando unit. This whole time, everything that he undertakes during the war, all of his colleagues knew that he'd been a cagoulard. It was not any kind of secret. Nobody once suggested in any sort of immediate testimony that there was any contradiction between what he'd done before the war and what he had done during the war. As I mentioned, after the war, Duclos promptly moves to Buenos Aires, where he lives uh, until his death in 1981. So he leaves Europe with basically a plethora of decorations. These include the Compagnon de la Libération, four citations for the prestigious Croix de Guerre, the UK Military Cross, he is an officer in the most excellent order of the British Empire, he has the Norwegian Krieg corset, and he's an officer in the Légion d'honneur. All these awards aside, Duclos technically is still considered to be a criminal on the run when he leaves for Buenos Aires because of the Cagoulard trial that had been inter interrupted by the outbreak of the war. So in 1945, the French courts start assembling the necessary material to resume the Cagoulard trial. And when the trial does start several years later, Duclos actually comes back on his own initiative to take the stand. And the reason I highlight his own initiative is because he basically does this as a platform to tell the court in no uncertain terms that he was unrepentant for his pre-war activities and that he in fact would do it all over again if he had to. But at this point, even though he's making a full admission of guilt, ultimately, um, nobody is willing to 
put this man in jail. I mean, he's a decorated war hero, uh, and his long list of accomplishments during the war is I mean, certainly longer than all the other Cagoulards. So they find him not guilty on November 26, 1948. And as quickly as he had come to Paris, he once more returns to Argentina. In Argentina, Duclos was the president of the local French Veterans Association and tended to mingle with all kinds of people, including those kinds of people who were politically suspect in the post-45 climate. He interceded with the French authorities on behalf of people being targeted in the purge of collaborators, many times in fact. He continues to correspond with de Gaulle, but he also makes it quite clear that he disapproves of some of de Gaulle's post-war actions, uh, particularly once de Gaulle starts making noise about Algeria becoming independent. This is not something that Duclos is particularly supportive of. But in short, Duclos engaged in many of the same kind of behaviors as he had before and during the war. So there's little to suggest that his political stance had been in any way changed by his experience in the resistance. And it's right here where Duclos' wartime experience is representative of many members of the extreme right. So like his fellow Cagoulards or members of the Corvignol, the other group that I look at, Duclos does not silence or adapt his political outlook. And this is contrary to earlier suggestions that suggested that the resistance was so unified and left-leaning that any rightist stance would naturally be silenced. Like his fellow resistors uh, from the right, Duclos does not appear to be motivated to resist because of any concerns for human rights or equality. Nor was he particularly keen on the resumption of Republican politics in 1945, but he still chose to resist even though it seemed quite clear that this successful resistance would lead to the restoration of the Republic. Now, since making generalizations about human motivations is pretty difficult, I don't really attempt to come up with a, an overarching explanation for behavior like people uh, like Duclos. But I can give you a few examples uh, of some of the things that did motivate the rightist resistors, just to give you a sense of, of what I've looked at. So the first is sort of the obvious one, and this is that there is absolutely no doubt that Germanophobia plays a role in most of these people's decision. And the reason for this, of course, is that much of the right wing in France had actually been very opposed to Germany in the interwar period. Many of them viewed the relationship between Germany and France as an unresolved situation, one that they knew would eventually break out in hostilities again. And just to give you a sense of how powerful this sentiment actually is, another one of the resistors that I look at, Georges Lustenau Le Coe, ends up securing a seat in the French National Assembly after the war. And so he is there as they start to talk about the possibility of a European army. I don't know if there are any sort of post-war historians here where they think about having a multinational army in Europe. And Lustenau Le Coe opposes the European army for the primary reason is because he doesn't believe that West Germans would ever fight on the right side. I mean, he just maintains the skepticism about loyalty of Germans in general. So this is definitely something that motivates almost all of these men and women. The second thing that I suggest is the importance of the military environment. So most of these men either come from the military at some point in their, in their past or hold the military in extremely high regard. And the fact that the French military, of course, is made pretty much impotent by the German occupation makes them very angry, right? So this is another motivating factor. Additionally, some of these men, it really comes down to patterns of behavior. So in some cases, these men uh, haven't necessarily changed their behavior, but the shifting nature of the situation in France meant that they fell on the wrong side of the Germans and thus almost fall sort of naturally into resistance this way. And so in some of these cases, it's less a conscious attempt in the beginning to resist and more a matter of a stubborn refusal to change in the face of German pressure. And of course, another thing, we can't discount the appeal of working in the shadows for some of these people. So they'd been doing this for many years. 
it was practically second nature to them. But as I just said, it, the Germans aren't particularly keen to have people running around doing things that aren't officially sanctioned. So sometimes these political activities were viewed with hostility by the Germans. Um, and a perfect example of that is another member of the Corvignol, Georges Groussard, um, who heads up Pétain's personal military police very early in 1940. And he is responsible for the arrest of Pierre Laval, the notorious collaborator. And the Germans, he does this on his, sort of his own initiative, and the Germans are furious and do everything they can to return Laval to power, shut down Groussard's activities, and this sort of natu like naturally pushes Groussard towards the resistance at that point. Uh, oddly enough, and it does seem odd in retrospect, because we know what Vichy was and we know about Pétain's own personal stance. But many of these men and women at the time believed that resistance was what Pétain would have wanted had he been free to act. So for some of them, they actually describe um, their own resistance as being motivated by loyalty to the Vichy regime. And this is especially the case at the very beginning of the war. Obviously, uh, you know, as time goes on, it becomes clearer and clearer that Pétain is not interested in resistance, and it becomes harder for these people to maintain those connections with Vichy, so they start to distance themselves. But there are hundreds of cases of right-wing resistors appealing to Vichy bureaucrats to help them get out of tight spots, and they mostly succeed early in the war. And finally, many of them are motivated by the same things that other resistors are, the need to, quote, do something, the thrill of secrecy, the enjoyment of leadership, etc. Where Duclos's story departs from his fellow rightist resistors is that he's actually, as I've just told you, venerated as a resistance hero. So in 1986, uh, the Amical Réseau Saint-Jacques, this was the, Saint-Jacques was the name of Duclos' resistance networks and his nom de guerre. Uh, in 1986, the Amical lays a commemorative plaque at 8 Place Vendôme, which was Duclos' former workplace and also the Saint-Jacques headquarters. Uh, is anybody familiar with the Place Vendôme? It's a very ritzy kind of place. So this is, Duclos is not coming from an impoverished background. He is definitely a man of money, as were many of these men, uh, which is an interesting side note about the Cagoulards, because they portray themselves not necessarily as this wealthy gang of people, but they definitely are. Anyways, at the official inauguration of the commemorative plaque, witnesses would only have heard the most laudatory aspects of Duclos' history. So the mayor of the first arrondissement praises Duclos by saying, and I quote here, Saint-Jacques was the nom de guerre of Maurice Duclos, who worked in the building before which we are today reunited. He was one of three free French who, after the 4th of August, 1940, performed a first mission of intelligence on the Channel Coast. But his goal was even more ambitious, since at the behest of General de Gaulle, it involved setting up a vast network in Paris and which was born right here at the headquarters of the Duclos company. He went on to give credit to the Réseau Saint-Jacques for establishing the first clandestine radio contact between London and Paris. And in the next speech given by General Jean Simon, he mentions Duclos' move to Argentina, of course doesn't explain why Duclos had moved to Argentina, and we can talk more about that. But Simon only noted that, and I quote, when General de Gaulle paid an official visit to that country in 1964, he overturned protocol in saluting Colonel Saint-Jacques before all the government authorities, end quote. And this, in fact, did happen in 1964. So clearly, de Gaulle got over his suspicion of former Cagoulards. Now, even in 1990, the Saint-Jacques network continued to be central in the commemoration of the resistance. For the commemoration of June 18th that year, flames were going to be lit in each arrondissement. And three of the flames were actually to honor the Réseau Saint-Jacques, which is described in the records as being the earliest of the networks of Free France. So naturally, one of the flames was lit at 8 Place Vendôme. One um, was another place where seven people had died. Uh, they'd been deported and died. And two young people had died uh, during the liberation. And the third flame was a place where eight members of the Free French were tortured and killed during the liberation as well. 
Three years later, in 1993, a celebratory postcard was issued featuring a heroic photo of Maurice Duclos. Now, what's interesting to me, well, there's many things interesting, but one of the interesting things is that as a distinct network, the Saint-Jacques network was not operational for very long. I mean, I basically just told you that it was decimated in 1941. So really, it's, it's only operational for a year. Um, but it's clearly significant, uh, particularly in the early days of the war, and it ends up retaining this key position in the memorialization of the resistance. But this does not accurately represent the fate of most rightist resistors, who by and large were left out of the post-war narrative about the resistance, which is very quickly portrayed as united, apolitical, and gaullist in nature. And for many years after the war, it was inconceivable for people to imagine that the extreme right could have resisted because of its complicity, obviously, with the Vichy regime. The Algerian war makes the situation even more complicated uh, as be both sides in that conflict, so the people who uh, supported keeping Algeria French and those who supported Algerian independence end up using the heritage of the resistance to legitimize their behavior, which throws into question what resistance actually means. As you probably know, the right certainly loses the battle to keep Algeria French, but also loses the battle to sort of keep the legitimacy of their actions using this resistance uh, discourse. And the wounds that are opened by the Algerian war and the renewed connection between the right and forces of repression made it even more difficult for these men to explain their trajectories from anti-government conspirators in the 1930s to resistance fighters during the war, to briefly finding their niche in politics in the late 40s and early 50s, because of course, as the Cold War heats up, uh, many of these men and women are actually valued as, as Cold Warriors, to advocating full-on rebellion against the Republic during the conflict in Algeria. And so the only reason that Duclos' resistance record is remembered so positively is because few people remember that he was a terrorist. His fellow Cagoulards, on the other hand, experience no such thing because they tend to be associated primarily with the Cagoul rather than the resistance. But the participation to varying degrees of all of these men, and I, I've been using the word man a lot, there are some women definitely in the story, but, but most of the guys I look at are male. Uh, their participation in the resistance suggests several things. So first and foremost, my work has shown that there is simply no way to determine in advance what course of action men and women might take in a time of great crisis. So in other words, I'm trying to encourage us all to remember that political affiliations are not necessarily the primary way that people self-identify. So sometimes we need to account for multiple and sometimes opposed identities within social groups. A second conclusion is that the situation from 1940 to 1944 obviously was incredibly complex. So in choosing to resist, these people are not necessarily abandoning the principles of the Vichy government or the national revolution that, that Pétain tries to undertake or any other changes that they wish to make to the government of France. So their story further emphasizes the fact that the resistance isn't the embodiment of everything opposite of Vichy, right? We're not looking at this kind of oddly opposed two blocks. Uh, sometimes the boundaries are, uh, you know, fluid there. The study of the extreme right and the resistance also, I think, forces us to challenge the very way we understand the concept of resistance. So this word has been saturated with revolutionary meaning, in particular of the French Revolution, 1789 kind. And many people have generally failed to take into account that the heritage of the French Revolution at this point no longer belongs exclusively to the left in France. So in my work, I argue that the more relevant tradition born of 1789 is actually one of insurrection rather than revolution. So looking at sort of a goal-oriented cooperation between many strands of political belief with a view to challenging legally constituted government. 
And as Jacques Semelé has argued, res resistance seen through the lens of 1789 is a rather simplified version. And he helpfully reminds us that it's really only during the Second World War that this word rediscovers a revolutionary tone. And he's, he reminds us that it had been earlier used to describe conservative opposition to the July monarchy in the 19th century. The party of resistance was full of conservatives then. So understanding that the right also had some claim to something of a revolutionary tradition, I use a small r rather than a capital R here, allows us, I think, to redefine resistance in a way that no longer by necessity privileges the left over the right. It allows for a more diverse explanation of motivations um, that rec recognizes continuity of thought and behavior in rightist resistors and more fully explains the participation and I think more importantly the cooperation of politically opposed people in the French resistance during the war. Thanks.